Uh, I don't talk a lot in public, so uh, I'd be gentle. Um, so, yeah, I work at Wix uh, in Tel Aviv, in Israel. Um, and who here has implemented event sourcing, a system in event sourcing? Okay. Okay, so I can't just say whatever I want. <coughs> who has heard of event sourcing? Okay, good. So I, I write systems in event sourcing, and I love it. Um, so I want more people who have heard of event sourcing to write, start writing systems in event sourcing. So this is basically an intro uh, into event sourcing. Okay, so um, the client uh, sends us commands. Right? They, they tell us to do some sort of operation. Uh, and at, on the server, we take the command and we transform it into an event. Um, the event is the, is the reporting of the action. And um, uh, an event is something that has happened. It's always something that has already happened. Okay? Um, and they are verbs in the past tense. So if, you, if the client says create a product, we turn that into product created or delete product, product deleted. It's always in the past tense. There's something that has happened. It's an event. Um, so what is event sourcing? Event sourcing is when the events are used as a mechanism for storage. Um, this is nothing new. It dates back hundreds of years. Can anyone guess who was doing event sourcing a couple hundred years ago? Thank you. Accounting. Um, accounting have been doing it for, for a long time. Uh, think of your bank account. Um, every row is an event. Okay, you have money coming in, money coming out, money coming out, money coming out, money coming out, money coming in. Uh, and then the the balance is just the, the states, right? The current states of of your system, um, and you get the state by applying the event to the state. Um, the last known value can be trusted because at any given point we can run transactions from the beginning of time for that account. So if you call your bank and you say, hey, that's not how much money I have, they'll say, okay, well, we'll play every single transaction that's ever taken place in your account and we'll recalculate how much you have and then we can verify how much you have. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a verifiable audit log and versioning system. Um, there are no deletes. So, you call your bank and you say, um, you made a mistake, you took 50 grivna out of my account for no reason. Uh, they won't go into your account and remove that line, right? They'll add another event depositing 50 grivna into it. Okay, so there's no, you don't ever delete any events, you can only <coughs> insert more events to, to correct or to, to get to the state that you want to get to. Um, so delete some models as events. Um, and it's inserting is great, uh, right? Deleting and updating is, uh, especially when we use my MySQL, uh, it's locking, it's bad, inserts are very easy to, to scale. Um, okay, so so in an event sourcing like, um, so system, you have two databases, right? You'd have one that stores all these events, and then you'd have another one that is sort of denormalized view. So back to the to, to your bank account, um, the let's say you let's say you had a view where you just wanted to see just the amounts, right? How much money you have, okay? So the system would go to the snapshots or the view and request just that field. Okay, so you'd have a table just with like user ID and the amount that he has in the bank. Um, you wouldn't go to the events every time. So, um, so the event sourcing side is very easy to write. You just convert it to an event and you save it. Uh, and the read side is denormalized, so it's fast. You're not doing anything in production like you would if it was a normalized sort of system. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we, we build uh, tables or, or views for almost every kind of use case, like like almost every DTO. So if we have a case class, let's say we, we have uh, let's say we have a, a product, right? We have we're selling on e-commerce on an online store. And there's one view of a product that just shows the name, the picture and the price. And then you click on it and you get a full blown sort of page with all the description and uh, all the other attributes of the product. So that would be two different like normalized 
Um, so anyway, super snapshots. So for this one, you get a quick, quick read here, and for that one, you get a quick read. Um, <coughs> debugging. Yes, debugging is one of the favorite parts of event sourcing. So um, when when a, a user calls up and says, uh, you know, I was using my system on Friday afternoon, and your system on Friday afternoon, and, and it fucked up, and, and I got this error message, and and I don't don't worry about it anymore because I already deleted that product and I, and I made a new one, but. When it happened, it, it didn't work. And you try to reproduce it, and you can't reproduce it, and, and you don't know what's going on. So uh, at this point, I can actually take all the events from that user, from the database, up until the point where he said he had a problem on Friday afternoon, play them with the debugger through my system, one by one, until I get to that path that threw the exception or, or, or did something bad. Right? So I'm actually seeing the system operate as it did at the time when the user was actually sending the request. Right? So this is really, really fun, really, really great way to, to find bugs. It's a great way also to validate. We don't do this, but I've heard of companies that before they GA to production, before they, they upload their next version, they'll take events and play it on the system and verify that the, the result is the same as what's, on, what's already on production. Um, okay, so like I said, you have two databases. You have the right side and the read side. On the read side, you might want to be fully consistent. You might want to be a bit consistent. Meaning, um, you might want to know 100% that the information I'm looking at is up to date. And you might want to lax that requirement so that you can have high availability um, going back to um, uh, let's go consistency and availability for the cap capture. Um, so, so I have a little diagram here uh, that I wrote. Um, so, so a client comes in and he requests some sort of view, right? So we can go like the, the product with the with the image and the price and the name. And it goes to the read service. It selects that row from the database. And if you're okay with that, it can return that straight to the user. If you want fully consistent. You have to go after selecting to the events table, see if there are any new events, apply them to the view, and then return your view so that you are fully consistent. So how do you apply an event to a view? Well, glad you asked. Um, it's very simple for functional programmers. Uh, um, I probably don't have to explain this, this line of code to any of you. But you're taking the, the view at, at its state. It could be zero, right? If I'm, if I'm playing your balance of your bank account, I could start from zero. And I could take every event and apply it to zero until I get to your current uh, balance. Or I could start in the middle you know, or where I am. Like, um, let's say your bank account maybe snapshots your, uh, your balance at the beginning of every month, right? So today's the whatever, the 8th or the 9th. Uh, when I go requests, when I log into my bank account, it takes a snapshot, which is uh, up to date from the 1st of April. And then it says, give me all the events that happened from the 1st of April to today. It applies all those events, and then it shows me how much money I have in my bank. Okay. So, that. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is a little uh, image that I took from somewhere. Uh, Showing the client um, sending the command, the command being transformed into an event, the event being stored, sending that event <laughs> to the write model, to the read model, and getting stored, and the reads coming in from the other side. Um, this also has to do with CQRS, which is another part of my talk that I cut out due to time. But uh, um, yeah, I like it a lot, and you should you should use it too. Um, any question? Yeah? What framework do you use in Please. Uh, we built our own. Uh, we built our own framework. Um, huh? Couple of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, we actually have plans to open source it. Yes. Um, we will open source it. Uh, it might take some time. Uh, but 
we, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not horribly complicated, right? I mean, that fault is the most complicated part in the system. Um, the functional programming is just like, it's a no-brainer. Uh, it, it's really, really fun and easy to do it yourself. Um, yeah, use ours, use ours once it comes out, and tell me how you like it. Yes. So it's less of a question, more of a quick comment. Uh, one of the one of the objections that, that a lot of people typically have to this kind of pattern is, you know, but but what do you do? You keep accumulating data. What do you do when you run out of disk space? And the answer to that would be beyond the, the canonical, you know, storage is cheap, so stop worrying about rid of any problems. Uh, something Greg Greg Young, who who sort of uh, uh, formalized this pattern uh, first said, you know, who told you you could delete data? Like you're, you're modifying mutable state on your database, you're basically losing the older state of the system. Who told you you're allowed to do that? Right, as a business constraint. Uh, I think that is a, a very kind of poignant uh, way of thinking about it because really, uh, if you do not lose state, you do not need an audit log, so that just makes everything, uh, you know, the, the, the natural extension of this is, you know, can you can you show me what the system would have been like had certain events happened, which is something that you cannot do in any, uh, any kind of non-event source system, uh, just becomes trivial, and that is a business, business requirement that often comes up late in the game after you've already run in production for a while. So that is, a, you know, that is a very interesting way of looking at it. You know, maybe this should be the default pattern because the, the you know the default mode of operation for most developers is I'm going to send updates to my database and lose data. Maybe you should not be doing that. So just food for thought. Yeah, absolutely. An update isn't the least. Yeah. And the question is regarding full consistency. Uh, what what uh, what will you do with uh, events uh, prior to the system during uh, your brain acquired uh, event lock while while, uh, while you are applying the uh, event lock new events derived to the system. Uh, I mean, that's the same problem you have in any system, right? If if someone's trying to see um, you know, get data from the database, and at the same time someone's writing it. Like, if they read before that it's written, then you won't have that in it, right? So, so you only get you only get what you have. So it's not fully consistent. It's uh, consistent uh, in terms of uh, time gap between the uh, uh, read request from the. Yeah, it's it's fully consistent in the way that if I don't have the information yet, I can't show it, right? The information uh, uh, not present uh, at the moment uh, of request from uh, event log. Right, that's but what you're saying. In the time between <coughs> when I got the events and processed them and returned them, then I got some more events. So that's the point of the difference. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah. Yes? How do you manage uh, relations between tables? For example, if, if I'm buying a product at price X, and then the product is modified to price Y, and I've already bought it at that price, do you just store like a reference uh, the version <coughs> of that data back in time, or do you actually need to normalize like, how you collect all that data in the purchase then? Right. Um, it depends what you know what the business logic is. Um, if if I add a product to my cart and when I added it, it cost a dollar, and then someone went in and changed it to two dollars, when I refresh my cart, it should say two dollars. So it should be up to date. Um, if we have a place where we need to save that as you know. It's one dollar. Then, then we will take a snapshot of that at that time and store it somewhere else. 
Well, you could you could reference the, the target entity along with its version. We could. Before. We could. Your your, um, your events. Uh, I mean, your uh, snapshots could also be immutable, right? So I said that um, the events come in, and then you're always storing events. You're always incrementing. And on the read side, you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, you could have a completely different technology for the database. It does, it's, it's a completely different system, right? You don't even need it, right? It's basically a catch. Because I can always, like your bank, when you log in, could always play the events, could play every, all the transactions you ever had, right? And it'll always be valid. It might be not optimized, right? Once you want to be optimized, then you start do, um, using a, a read model, which is denormalized and updated from the events. Your source of truth is the events. Um, so when, you, when you're deciding about your read model, you could say, OK, whenever a product is updated, or whenever my entity is updated, I'm going to replace it. Right? I'm going to do an update. You could say that I want it to be immutable, that every time uh, my product is updated, I'm going to add another product row to my table. And, and fetch the, the max. Uh, and then, in that case, you could save a version uh, of the product at that time. Yeah. yeah. What, <coughs> what problems do you solve with uh, one source? And maybe page construction or build? Page construction? The page construction. Uh, I don't know about page construction, but well, the question was, what, what, what problems does event sourcing solve? In your company. In my company? Yes. Oh, oh what, what systems use it? Yes. Ah, ah, ah. Um, uh, the e-commerce system uses it. Um, the catalog of the... Almost all systems, all the, all the, all the microservices in e-commerce are either currently event sourcing or about to be event sourcing. Um, that's the, the catalog, the ordering system, the payment system. Um, the cart system, every, all the parts uh, are event sourced. Um, what else? The invoices, web, web projects that uh, you can, uh, as a owner, uh, send an uh, offer for payment for someone, and you can pay and you can get the money. So, this invoice is everything in event sourcing. I started implementing event sourcing at Wix probably about a year and a bit ago, and that was the first. And it's it's really catching on. Like there's probably about three teams who are doing it now, and more teams coming up to me and asking, "How did you do it? You know, we we, we like we've seen it and we won." We have, so we have five running projects in Vitalsync. We're looking seriously to have a fully Vitalsync shop in CQRS, and we're looking also on maybe we will be on lack of resistance or lag on. We we now evaluating what is the best for us. We, want, we like this approach. We don't like to do the delete and update for store, so we want that like approach. Good for us. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you do when uh, your uh, state and event types evolve? Do you use the shorting? So uh, I think the question was what happens when your, your events need to change? Yeah. Right? And okay. state. And state. So, so yeah, so like, so say we have a product and we want to add another field, right? So, um, the way we do it is we've, we've broken down the events into the, okay. Uh, so the way it should be done, right? Uh, um, um, I, I've, I've read a lot of Greg Young and seen his, his videos, and he has, a, he has this example. <coughs> a command should <laughs> capture the intent of the client. Okay? When Sorry, I mean that you recover from the state from your journal. So if your uh, events uh, uh, changed uh, during the uh, lifetime of an entity, and you have different uh, revisions of uh, the same event in the room. Or different snapshots with different states. Uh, different version of events. Yeah, so it's uh, events, you can change events, right? Once, once you're stored in the database, you have to support the data that's, that's there. So events, all events are always, uh, always going to be in your code. Right. So as long as you type of event, it 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you, we, we create a new type of event when we need to add something new. Um, so to, to make it as less ugly as possible, we, we break the events down very, very small. So the price has an event, and the description has an event. And so when you add a new field, it's just adding a new event. Right? So if we want a view that just has price and name, we read all the events, and we only care about the ones that we only apply the ones that have to do with the name and, and the price. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, what about reading stuff? So, one second. Yeah, you had a question? How about fields in the core values when you have to add such a field? Do you add an automatically event for a log? No, 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 we try not to write events sort of for no reason. Uh, I mean, in Scala, you can have the default value in your case class, and then when you get an event that changes that default value, um, that's how we do it. Um, you could, I mean, you could, add, you know, uh, when you bootstrap, when you start up, you could write a bunch of events just to give you that initial sort of state. Um, so it's up to you. Hold on one second. And what about the read inside the if you have some where they capture the events, you don't have to use the uh, the Yeah, you could do it. Uh, yeah. Um, if you need some information, that's just that can be extra fixed for the event. Yeah. So it's when you add a new event, for example, right? That cannot. That can, that can be deriving the event. Yeah. So this is the question was I think but I'm going to repeat it. So um, what do you do when you have the read side, the denormalized side that doesn't have all the information that you want, but that you have in the events? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that happens a lot. Like. Um, Basically, I mean, why would you need to update your read model, right? Usually, it's because the client comes up to you and says, OK, uh, I need another field, like, add, add this to my JSON, right? Um, so in that point, we would add a new endpoint for that, that, new, um, that new sort of view, right? Um, and then that would be populated. And then that, that view would be built. Eventually, they would all migrate to that, and we could like remove the old endpoint, um, but we do sort of that two-step uh, migration. Yeah. Uh, how do you create incremental ID for each message in your system? In the events? We have a lot of time. Okay, last question. Last question. Uh, we don't use increments ID. Uh, how do you your distributed systems? We time? use timestamp. Timestamp? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the event table has uh, the event ID, has the GUID, event GUID. Um, it has the version, which is timestamp, and then the event data, which is a JSON. Just three columns. There's maybe some more under the hood, but that's basically it. Uh, I'm around, of course, if there's any more questions. Thank you very much.